the flagship programs of the Department of English at St. Berkman's College and is instituted in memory of Professor C.A. Shepherd. Professor Shepherd was our former head of the department and one of the stalwarts of the academy ever since he joined St. Berkman's in 1943. He was an exceptional scholar, writer, and a habile academician. Professor Shepherd left us in 1979, but his memory lives on in the hearts of everyone who had the good fortune and privilege of knowing him. We have been very fortunate to have had the benediction of some world-renowned scholars, thinkers, teachers, philosophers, who gave lectures and talked to us in memoriam, Professor C.A. Shepherd. We've had the privilege of listening to Professors Gayatri Spivak, Akhil Bilgrami, Arjuna Padurai, David Bromwich, Richard Shekner, Laura Malvi, Homi Baba, and most recently, Toril Moy. And today, we are extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Stanley Fish. Professor Fish is a public intellectual, a literary theorist, and a legal scholar who is the Florsheimer Distinguished Professor of Law at the Benjamin Cardasso School of Law in New York. To students of literature, however, Professor Fish is perhaps best known for his influence in reader response theory. Before we proceed further, let's have a moment of prayerful silence in memory of Professor Shepherd. Thank you. We have with us Father Rajip Kurian, the principal of our college. Let me invite Father Principal for a few words of welcome. Thank you, Vimal. Dear and respected Professor Stanley Fish, Reverend Dr. Thomas Padiet, manager, St. Dokman's College, other dignitaries, vice principals, Professor P.J. Thomas, head, the Department of English, former teachers, invited guests, and my dear students. Good evening to all. I feel delighted to welcome everyone to the 33rd C.A. Shepherd Memorial Lecture, organized by the Department of English, St. Bergman's College, Changanashiri. Especially in the centenary year of, of the establishment of this college. This memorial lecture helps us to fondly recall the memory of a drawing of this college, Professor Colin Anthony Stewart Shepherd. Professor Shepherd joined this college as a lecturer in English in 1943 and became the head of the department in 1949. He was an inspiring teacher, a delightful speaker, a writer, and a director. An erudite and inspiring teacher, Professor Shepherd was a noble and dignified human being as well, whose memory is ever fresh in the hearts of his students and colleagues. Professor Stanley Wish, Fish, the American theorist, legal scholar, author, and the public intellectual who has agreed to give the 33rd C.A. Shepherd Memorial Lecture, which is a joyous occasion for the Department of English and the college. It is my proud privilege to welcome Professor Stanley Fish formally to the college. I am sure Professor P.J. Thomas will introduce this American literary critic, particularly associated with reader response criticism to the audience who are virtually connected far and wide. Let me take this opportunity to thank Professor Stanley Fish for his generosity in accepting our invitation and giving this memorial lecture. On behalf of the Berkman's community, I welcome you to this program, sir. Thank you. Reverend Dr. Thomas Padiet, our manager, 
does not need a formal introduction at all. I think he is with us, you know, with us in this meeting, and he is with us in all our endeavors, and motivates us to do the task with utmost sincerity and commitment. Dear Father, I wholeheartedly welcome you to this program. I cordially invite. our vice principals dr benny matthew reverend dr josh george and dr joseph job our former professors heads of the departments teachers from neighboring colleges and do, and those who are virtually connected to this function i would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude towards all those who contributed to this event especially dr pj thomas head of the department of english my special thanks to the coordinator of this event dr pimal mohan john last but not the least i hold up hold heartedly welcome all my dear students to this function welcoming you all once again i remain thank you thank you father let me now invite our head of the department dr pj thomas to introduce the speaker hello i think i am audible yes Can yes hear me? Yeah. Oh, thank you vimal and on the on behalf of the department of english uh, let me say a big hello to all of you and uh, also welcome our manager of principal Uh, other distinguished uh, participants, wel welcome again to the department virtually. And for me personally, this is uh, like a dream come true occasion. You know, I had the rarest opportunity to attend two mini seminars uh, by Dr. Fish, one in 1997 and the second one in 2004. Ever since, I have been trying to befriend him. And bring him uh, to the campus of SP, but I found that he is very uh, difficult to be different. But somehow, uh, this opportunity of uh, the COVID, uh, you know, made this possible. That way, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really happy. Um, around uh, 2,400 participants have registered. That means that all of you have. Uh, registered for it because you know uh, Professor Fish and his work in part or some of you in full. And I don't venture into a very academic kind of introduction, but uh, I would uh, make a very short, formal, and ritualistic introduction just to make the transition because uh, we have to keep the promise to Professor Fish that we have to end the program by 8:30. So I'm extremely grateful to uh, Professor Fish for having consented to do this lecture. Um, currently, <clears throat> Stanley, Professor Stanley Fish is the Davidson Khan Distinguished University Professor and Professor of Law, Florida International Uni University, and Dean Emeritus of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Distinguished Professor of English, Criminal Justice and Political Science, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has also taught at more than a dozen prominent universities in the US. For lack of time, I don't want to list all of them here. There's a bi-yearly lecture series in his honor, the Stanley Fish Lecture at the University of Illinois, Chicago, a living testimony to his legendary teaching career. He's also a distinguished author of numerous books and articles which include the path breaking work of reader response criticism. Is there a text in this class? Interpretive communities and the sources of authority in 1980, a work which all of us uh, uh, really know so well. And I would also in, uh, mention professional correctness, literary studies and political change in 1999, which is a very provocative work. And 
as a proof of his uh, prolific writing and communication, an archive has been established at the University of California, Evine Library for the collection of his papers, correspondence, files, tapes, etc. There have been more than 200 articles, books, dissertations, etc. already devoted to his work. So he's also a shining star in the media, which include uh, his presence in the CNN, C-SPAN, Larry King Live Show, Judy Jarvis, NBC Nightly News, etc. Currently, his research uh, interest uh, is in cinema and law. So he has to, we know he calls himself an Andy Foundationist. Uh, but anyway, since uh, much ado, I, uh, you know, welcome uh, Professor Fish in the name of all of you to give this uh, 33rd Shepherd Memorial Lecture. Over to you, Professor Fish. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and it's an honor, a distinct honor for me to be asked to give the CA Shepherd Memorial Lecture. Thanks to all who made uh, this possible. Uh, and uh, thanks to all uh, who are attending uh, this event. The lecture I'm about to give is a lecture in the topic of legal interpretation. And I should say a few words in advance. Some of what I say will be known to most of you, uh, but perhaps some of you uh, will find it helpful. In recent years, legal interpretation has achieved the status of a chief topic in the legal academic world. And there are three accounts of legal interpretation that are in competition. Those three accounts are textualism, intentionalism, and living constitutionalism. Textualism and intentionalism are subsets of something called originalism. And you will all, I think, have heard of originalism. Originalism is really a simple concept. It says that when you're trying to figure out what a clause or phrase in a constitution or a statute, a law means, you return to the time when that statute or constitution was produced and you study the words as they would have been understood at that contemporaneous moment. So originalism is backward looking. It says that the understanding of the present is controlled by the understanding of the past. If you want to apply a statute or a clause in the constitution to a present day case, you must first go back and figure out what that clause or phrase meant in 1778 or 1850 or 1930 or whatever the date might be. There are within the originalist camp two distinct strains. One is textualism, which says more or less, that the way to determine what a text means is to figure out what its words meant at the time of production. Intentionalism, on the other hand, argues, no, what you have to understand is what is in the mind of those who produced these words. You have to first assign or ascertain or somehow determine the, in, their intention, and then you can proceed to the job of interpretation. That's a general overview of the landscape. And I should uh, add, uh, for purposes of clarification, that I am an intentionalist uh, and a very strong intentionalist. Having said as much, I'll begin uh, the more or less formal remarks. I have come to believe that textualism, the thesis that one interprets a text by determining the meaning its words would have had 
at the moment of production is like the villain in 1980 slasher movies. No sooner do you think you have killed it, then it arises again to menace you with the same old moves performed perhaps with a new twist. The no longer so new twist these days performed by textualist goes by the name of original public meaning or OPN. And it offers itself as a new originalism that escapes the defects or strictures directed at the old originalism, that is, at intentionalism. I am here today to argue that the new originalism is an old dead end. And that is the dead end of plain meaning, ordinary meaning, textual meaning, literal meaning, objective meaning, semantic meaning, the list goes on and on, but what, what, why, by whatever name it calls itself, this method fails to do the interpretive job. If only because as a method, textualism has no object on which to work its promised wonders. And I'll explain that in a moment. And without an object that can serve as a ground for its procedures, textualism cannot even get started. Before I elaborate this claim, let me put on the table a few examples of attempted communication, utterances that ask the question, what does this mean? A few years ago, my wife and I got off a plane at a rural upstate New York airport. It was 1130 in the evening, almost midnight, and the first thing that met our eyes was a sign strategically placed so that it would, would it be immediately seen. The sign read, hot sandwiches now being served in the Euro Cafe. Hot sandwiches now being served in the Euro Cafe. What did it mean? Did it mean that I could walk down the hall and get a hot sandwich? Or did it mean that the menu had changed and hot sandwiches were now being served in this cafe which was at 11.30 in the evening, closed. You, understand, you see the problem. The question, what does it mean, cannot be answered by looking at the words. There's a great deal more. You have to instead figure out what those who placed the sign there had in mind. At least that's my argument. Here's another example. Back in the 90s, President Bill Clinton came before the American people uh, and said, quote, I did not have sexual relationship with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. So my question there was Bill Clinton lying and we will return to it. Here is another one. During the 2016 American presidential campaign, Donald Trump declared, that President Obama and his opponent, Hillary Clinton, were the founders of ISIS. He was invited to acknowledge that he wasn't speaking literally, but Trump emphatically declines. Yes, I meant it literally. He has been speaking ironically, as anyone should have known. Was he lying? Another example, in 1702, the English pamphleteer, Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe, wrote a little pamphlet entitled, The Shortest Way with Dissenters, in which it was said that the shortest, that is the most expedient way to deal with, with dissenters was to kill them all. Did he mean it? And finally, a small list of examples. Let's say a New York streetwise kid, a 17 or 18 year old kid, encounters a middle aged visitor who wears a shirt, a tie, and a jacket, and even has a bowler hat. 
the kid looks at this man and says, man, you're bad. What did he say? Now, I will bring a few of these moments back on stage in the course of my analysis uh, of textualist or originalist public meaning arguments. As I said earlier, these arguments are always being renewed. And I'll be responding in this paper to a version of them offered by a law professor named Brian Slocum uh, in a recent book called Ordinary Meaning, A Theory of the Fundamental Principle of Legal Interpretation. I bring in Professor Slocum simply because uh, he is a convenient and recent author. I could have brought, brought in 20 others. Slocum is concerned to refute the arguments of intentionalism. And his first move is to say that strong intentionalism of the kind I preach couldn't possibly be correct because, quote, it is inconsistent with ordinary meaning doctrine. Of course it is. That's the whole point of urging intentionalism. And it can't be a point against it that it entails the failure of the doctrine it explicitly opposes. What is the doctrine? What is textualism or ordinary public meaning? Here is Slocum's definition. It is the thesis that interpreting legal rules is an exercise that relies on conventions of language which largely constitute the ordinary meaning doctrine. And then in a more formal vocabulary, Slocum repeat, repeats the point when he defines ordinary meaning as, quote, the linguistic meaning or meanings that a sentence S has in language L. Meanings, he adds, that are independent of what individual people mean. Let me say an aside, and an aside that I don't understand why linguists and philosophers believe that by saying S and L instead of sentence and language, that they've done something impressive. Um, it's just a kind of window dressing that goes nowhere. Now, Professor Slocum knows that meaning, the words that meanings have are not inherent in them. He does not regard words as containing within them the essence of the things they point to, as if God gave us those words as he did to Adam in Eden. Slocum is not making the mistake that Plato satirizes in his dialogue, The Cratylus. Rather, the meanings we consider ordinary, he tells us, are considered so because of the strength of the conventions associated with particular sounds or marks. Quote, thus the connection between the signifier and the signified is not irrational or natural, but is instead conventional. And here I agree with Slocum. Ordinary, in short, is a statistical measure. This is an extremely important point. It is the report of field surveys by linguists and others. Ordinary is not a normative measure. So it does turn out that words do have meaning because of an agreement between speakers in a certain language community to associate a signifier, a sound or a mark with a certain signifier. But no sooner has Slocum said this correct thing, then he draws from it an unwarranted inference. Quote, while words have the meanings assigned to them by the users of language, these meanings are independent of any particular authorial intention. And that's your big textualist thesis. You can look at language independent of any consideration of intention and proceed to the business of interpretation. Well, yes and no. These meanings, these ordinary meanings are in play because of the resolve or intention of a particular author to deploy that system of mock meaning correlations rather than another. In other words, a speaker, you, I, or anyone has at his or her disposal any number of codes within which and by means of which to deliver 
a message. The choice of codes is his or hers. Once the speaker or author forms an ax on the intention to deploy a certain code and not some other, the meanings of the words she sends out into the world are dictated by that choice. And in that sense, are independent of her further intention as long as she continues to speak in that language or code. And, and this is again an, an important point, the choice of language or code belongs to the speaker, not to the audience. So for example, if I am a buyer of goods and I write a letter to a vendor and I use quote, the jargon of the trade, that is the mark meaning correlations conventionally shared by those who inhabit this commercial practice. In that context, the words and phrases I use will have those meanings, the meanings that belong to the jargon of the trade, and I am bound to them. I am bound to them not independently of my intention, but as a result of my intention to speak in that language, a choice again that is mine. Slocum regards systems of conventional meaning as constraints, a word he uses often. They are more properly characterized as resources. Depending on what work you want, the meanings you intend to do, depending that is on your goals of communication, you can choose to use this code or some other. But you are not constrained to make that choice, nor are you constrained to stick with the choice if for some reason you decide later on to engage in code switching. When Slocum insists there are facts about what words mean, he is correct. But the facts are sociological, not linguistic. They belong to patterns of word usage, not to something called language L in the abstract. With respect to any given language or code, whether it be ordinary language, jargon of the trade language, street language, the mark you make or the sound you utter will have a meaning. And the existence of that meaning can be termed a fact, but the meaning won't be identified by pointing to the mark or hearing the sound. You must first know what language or code is being used, in what language or code is the speaker addressing you. And then you can talk with confidence about the meanings the code enables and say that those meanings exist as a matter of fact. The key question, and this is where textualism simply falls down, the key question is how do you know what code or language the person you are listening to or reading is using? That's the big question. Slocum's answer is that the text will tell you, quote, Sufficient clues about the language of the text can be found in the text itself, unquote. But that is flat out wrong. Consider again the trade usage context and the possibilities that parties to a commercial agreement would disagree as to what language was being deployed. Here's a disagreement. I say that when I ordered chickens from you, I meant by the word chickens, what the man in the street would mean by it. You say, no, we should go with what the word means in the poultry trade. Can this dispute be resolved by looking at the text? No, because the dispute is precisely about the language the text is written in. Ordinary language or jargon of the trade language. In both languages or codes, chickens is a word, but it is a word with different meanings. And looking at the word, as, or as textualists do, isn't going to tell you what code it is a part of. What you have to do is pose questions like, 
What were the expectations of the parties? Were both parties old hands in the chicken trade? Did they have prior dealings? In asking these questions, you wouldn't be trying to figure out what a word or a phrase means. You would be trying to figure out what language the word or a phrase is a component of. You would be trying to figure out the intention of the speaker, the intention to speak in this code or that one. And once again, the text considered in itself won't tell you. Now back to one of my examples. When Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton in the 1990s said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. In his language, as he later explained, sexual relation means penile penetration and does not include oral stimulation. That's his understanding of what sexual relation means. But many, if not most of those who heard him spoke a language in which the phrase sexual relations covered both actions, penile penetration and oral stimulation. When it turned out that Clinton had engaged in oral sex with Ms. Lewinsky, many concluded that he had lied, but he hadn't. You lie when you say something knowing that it's false. Clinton said something knowing that it was true in the language or code he was speaking. And the choice of language or code is the speaker's. The implication is one that Slocum notes, and he does so in the spirit of offering what he takes to be a knockdown refutation of intentionalism, which he complains if taken seriously, leads to the conclusion, quote, that a text can therefore never fail to mean what the author intends it to mean. This is Slocum saying, you know, it can't be the case that a text can never fail to mean what its author intends to mean. But that is precisely the case. As John Searle, eminent American philosopher, explains uh, with his usual conciseness. Here is Cyril. If Robinson Crusoe is alone on his island and he decides to say yech, that is Y-E-C-C-H, decides to say yech, uh, uh, I'm sorry, every time he sees something that disgusts him and he intends that this will be the expression of disgust then he cannot fail to express disgust every time he utters the expression yeah with that intention. So meaning cannot fail from the intentionalist point of view. Although as we shall see in a moment, communication, something entirely apart from meaning can fail. Slocum objects that intender's meaning cannot fail that if intenders meaning cannot fail, authors are the only parties qualified to interpret their own works. But actually it's worse than that. Even authors aren't qualified necessarily to interpret their own works because an author does not enjoy a privileged relationship to his own intentions. And he can be mistaken about his own intentions just as someone else can be mistaken about his intentions. Uh, and if the mistake is corrected by further reflection or by psych psychoanalysis or by an extended conversation, the author will have a revised sense of what his words meant. He will have changed his mind about what his intention was. Think of the husband who says to his wife, we haven't been to the movies in a long time. We haven't been to the movies in a long time. A simple descriptive sentence, right? Wrong. Because his wife then rebukes him for criticizing her. Indignant, he replies, I was just reporting a fact. We haven't been to the movies in a long time. I didn't mean anything by it. I wasn't voicing a complaint against you. 
That's what he says to his wife. He's going to lose this one every single time. It's quite possible and likely, if my marriage is any kind of example, that after thinking it over, the husband comes to the conclusion that he was wrong about what he meant when he said we haven't been to the movies in a long time and that his wife was a better reader of his intentions than he was. This is a perfectly ordinary case, occurs in marriage every day. It is still the case that the intender's meaning cannot fail. It's just that the intender now has a clearer understanding of what that meaning was because he has a clearer understanding of what his intention was. Now, Searle's hypothetical Robinson Crusoe example allows me to correct Slocum on another point. Slocum repeatedly contrasts the public meaning that is for him the ground and constraint of interpretation with meanings he dismisses as idiosyncratic or private meanings, meanings that exist only in a speaker's mind. But even though Robinson Crusoe is alone on his island and is speaking only to himself when he says, yeah, or anything else, he is employing a public language that is a system of mock meaning correlations that extend over time and one that he could in principle teach to someone else. He could teach someone else what yech means and allow them to join the public expression of yech. Crusoe's language is only private in the uninteresting sense that the population of its speakers and hearers is small, indeed very small. Now, in a moment of uncharacteristic generosity, let me say that Slocum isn't wrong about everything. He is right to say that if, as intentionalists argue, texts do not signal the code they are written in, communication becomes problematic and vulnerable to failure. A speaker or writer may deploy a code without telling anyone and then rebuke those who misunderstood him, misunderstand him, leaving his readers or hearers without the comeback, but you said, that's what Donald Trump did when after days of insisting that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton founded ISIS, he announced that he was speaking ironically. The retort that you want to make, no, you weren't, won't work. Because again, Trump gets to say what language he was speaking in of course, he may be playing games with us, but in that game, he owns all the cards because he is the only one who can specify the language or code he was using. Now, it may sound odd to call irony a language. Slocum understands it as a deviation from public meaning and as an instance of the distinction between what is said and what is meant. In his analysis, Irony happens when the words in and of themselves deliver one meaning, but you intend another. Leaving your hearer or reader with a two-step task. First, understand the meaning the words naturally have, and then see the words in this perspective of a revealed ironic intent. But it would be more accurate to say that irony is a code in which the prime directive is reverse the meanings of the code called ordinary language. If you speak within that code and your hearers understand you to be doing so, and if both you and your hearers are practiced code performers, your words mean only one thing and mean it immediately. There is no two-step procedure in which you first fix on the ordinary standard meaning and then depart from it on the basis of an added ironic intention. There is just one step in which you hear 
the single meaning uh, intended. Think of another of my examples. When the streetwise kid in New York says to the Midwestern square who comes out of the uh, subway entrance, quote, you're bad man. He intends an act of praise because in the code he is using, that's what bad means. It means cool, sophisticated, good. The hearer who shares, shares that code will understand bad as a statement of approval without first having to go through or discount an ordinary or standard meaning. The square, on the other hand, will be confused. He will wonder why he is being accused of some crime of which he had been unaware. He too will understand bad immediately, but because he mistakes the code in which the word is a component, his understanding will be defective. He doesn't know what bad means, not because he hasn't researched the history of the word bad, because he, but because he is ignorant of the code in which the speaker is, within which the speaker is operating. Now, the point of all of these examples is to deny the distinction between what is said and what is meant. Uh, the point of this example is to deny the distinction between what is said and what is meant. You can't pinpoint what has been said without first determining what was meant. Now, this is a very large statement. But I realize it because a lot of people believe and a lot of philosophers and linguists believe that you can make the distinction between what is said on the one hand and what a speaker meant on the other hand. And I'm saying, no, you cannot. You can't pinpoint what has been said without first determining what was meant. Identifying what is meant, that is what is intended, is prior to identifying what is said. Both to emerge together in an indissoluble package. If there is the distinction, it is the distinction between the codes or languages employed by speakers and the codes or languages assumed to be in use by hearers. If anything comes apart in communication, it is not what was said and what was meant, but the understandings of persons differently situated with respect to the identification of the language being spoken. So it's possible for you to mistake what has been said, not because there's a distinction between what is said and what is meant, but because you are not in a position to understand or see what was meant. And therefore you don't know what was said. There's absolutely no space at all between what is said and what is meant. Uh, so, uh, okay. The identification of the language or code being used often goes hand in hand with the specification of purpose, setting, and a great deal else. If you know that the person speaking to you or writing to you is employing the jargon of a trade you both practice, you will also know why that is in the service of what goal he is speaking that way. You will know what posture he is assuming, what strategies he is likely to employ even before he employs them. This is something called pragmatic knowledge and is the subject of a field called pragmatics, which Slocum defines as, quote, the study how, of how extra meaning is read into utterances without actually being encoded in them. And I'm going to reject entirely the idea of extra meaning for the same reason that I reject the distinction between what is meant and what is said. Pragmatics, in short, is an added plus to, to encoded meaning. It kicks in, Slocum and others tell us, when the encoded meaning is an up to the full interpretive task when it, that is the text, doesn't tell you enough. 
But in the counter picture I have been drawing, there is no encoded meaning, no self-identifying level of semantic communication. And the so-called extra meaning thought to be provided by pragmatic cues is provided by the information rich choice to use one code rather than another. When you deploy a code or a language, you do more than simply make a linguistic choice. You make a choice that involves the entire world in which that code or language is habitually used. Slocum takes it as a strong argument against me that my analysis, in my analysis, there would be no need to distinguish between semantics and pragmatics. In fact, that's weak. In my analysis, there would be no possibility of distinguishing between semantics and pragmatics because neither exists in the state of self-sufficient isolation, text over here and context over there that would allow us to tell one from the other. What I do is pack all the information supposedly yielded by pragmatics into the different languages or codes chosen by speakers and, writing, and writers. Those languages or codes are doing all the work. When you have identified the intentional or purposive context of utterance, your interpretation of individual words and phrases will bring along with it the entire lived world encompassed by that context. Let me illustrate with a few examples. If you're reading a contracts case and know that it is a contracts case and not a nasty change of letters between two parties who were once friends and you come across the word consideration, which is a technical word in Anglo-American contract law, you will understand without reflection that the word consideration means something offered in the course of a bargain for exchange. You don't have to ask yourself, what is the ordinary meaning of consideration? And then ask, is there also a non-ordinary meaning that is pertinent here? The assumption that this is a legal context and that your speaker is proceeding from a legal perspective and therefore deploying legal language. That assumption gives you the meaning of the word and you may call it an ordinary meaning as, as it is when you are engaged in contract negotiation. But there is no ordinary meaning of consideration in the abstract that can serve as a baseline. There is only the ordinary meaning that will immediately emerge in any particular situation or communication. As when a wife says to her husband, you have no consideration. In the domestic context, that is a perfectly clear sentence. You have no consideration and you know perfectly what it means. You don't take me into account at all. You think only of yourself. It, and, and it is a differently clear sentence when it is spoken by a lawyer to a client who wishes to enter into a contract. The lawyer explains, you have no consideration. As a string of words, you have no consideration has no meaning except the meaning it inquire, acquires in context or to make the point from the other direction, it is impossible to, to hear. You have no consideration without hearing it as having in, been produced in some intentional context or another. Context is not something that you can have recourse to in these arguments as if it were a separate register or area. It's not, it's all one thing. If you understand and agree with my example of consideration, you have no consideration as spoken by a lawyer or as spoken by a wife, then you understand and agree with my entire argument. And we'll see whether or not you do. Okay, uh, another example, and this one from academic life. We who are academics have all either read or read articles which contain phrases like, as I have explained elsewhere, or as I have written elsewhere, 
What does that phrase, as I have explained elsewhere, mean? A textualist might huff and puff and produce a prosaic paraphrase. The author has written about this issue before. But as academics situated in the academic world, we know and knew, know immediately what that clause means. What that clause means when you say, as I have explained elsewhere, you are saying, I am a credentialed expert. I am an authority. I've already explained this and I'm somewhat irritated at having to do it again. I know more about this than you do. So don't raise any impertinent objections. And again, that cluster of meanings isn't added to the literal meaning as, of as I have explained elsewhere. There is no literal meaning of as I have explained elsewhere. Or that cluster of meanings is the literal meaning of as I have explained elsewhere when it is spoken or written by an academic to an academic audience. Now, if everything I have said is true, now, if everything I have said is true, the consequences for the goal of achieving successful communication are potentially very unhappy. Given the possibility of hearing words within different assumptions about the language they are part of, and given the impossibility as I argue, of identifying the language being employed by just looking at or listening to the utterance, all kinds of things can go communicatively wrong and all kinds of mischief can be perpetuated, perpetrated when they do. Again, examples abound in every marriage. I will leave you to think about your own. But for a more public example, when Daniel Defoe, a religious dissenter himself, published The Shortest Way with Dissenters, he proved himself to be an 18th century Stephen Colbert, but without the saving grace of an audience that recognized his intention. Defoe so successfully impersonated the voice of the Tory anti-dissenters that he was attacked at all sides. He was arrested. He was in prison. Literary critics hundreds of years later are still debating exactly what he meant and therefore exactly what he said. He tried to explain it on several occasions, but all of his explanations uh, fell heir to the same sea of communicative troubles that bedeviled the original reception of his pamphlet. What a mess. But it's not all that bad all the time. So Slocum complains that if what he calls anomalous meanings, meanings that depart from ordinary conventions, are allowed to call the interpretive tune, communicative success is rendered mysterious. Nothing mysterious about it. Sex successful communication does occur. It is my fervent hope that it is occurring now. You'll let me know. But successful communication does occur, not because of some form of language called ordinary, plain, literal, whatever, uh, is, is in place and, and is constraining what language, what meanings can be imputed to. Rather, successful communication occurs when the assumptions of hearers and readers about the language being used by speakers and writers are correct. While there is no method by which that happy meeting of the minds can be brought about, in a number of contexts, the likelihood of its happening is high. In a number of contexts, communication, ex communicative success is pretty much assured because of practice specific conventions about the employment of language conventions. Thus, it is usually warranted to assume that when you are watching the nightly news on television or hearing a Supreme Court justice deliver an opinion, you can assume that ordinary meaning is the meaning or is the medium of expression being deployed. You can assume that because 
nightly news anchors and Supreme Court justices know that they're speaking to very general audiences and they want to be understood by as large an audience as possible. Therefore, they will have recourse to what Slocum calls ordinary public meaning. It's a strategic move and a good move. Uh, so when Slocum says that the unsponsored nature of statutes, the fact that they are delivered in an institutional and not a personal voice, necessitate the ordinary meaning doctrine. He is correct, although necessitate is a bit strong. In both contexts, national news broadcasts and the delivery of legal rules or opinions, the practice includes as a feature of its landscape, the obligation to communicate, as I have said, with the largest audience possible. And accordingly, practitioners will have recourse to the language code hearers and readers associate with such public context. That's ordinary public meaning. Here, a political choice of a sociological fact. So ordinary meaning and ordinary and original public meaning do exist, not as constraints, but as options for, for intenders. They have the status of a lingua franca, a way of speaking known to everyone including those who in their daily verbal practices might speak in a more restricted dialect. There is always the possibility, however, that a news anchor or a reporter or a judge will slip into the dialect of her childhood or neighborhood and intend meanings that are not in the statistical sense ordinary. If that happens and members of her audience continue to hear her within the assumption that she is speaking in ordinary uh, public meaning, they will be mistaken about what she means. They won't be able to understand it. For, for Slocum, this conclusion that the author's meaning stands supreme, even if the audience has little or no choice of discerning it, he says that's very problematic that the author's meaning stands supreme, even if the audience has little or no chance to discern it. Uh, and he complains that this amounts to the counterintuitive proposition, and here he's using letters again, a text mean, a text T means P, even in situations in which the audience is justified in concluding that the text means Q, if and only if the author intended it to mean P. Why people write sentences like that? Why those who read philosophical texts of this kind put up with them? I haven't the slightest idea. All these people should qu quit, go home and do some honest work. What justifies the audience in concluding that the meaning of a text is Q rather than P is its sincere and reasonable belief that the speaker, the author is speaking in one language or code rather than another. But that justification is built on sand because the belief that your speaker or writer is employing one code rather than another, even though it's supported by all the evidence that you might have is a mistake. The writer is speaking in another language. Now that might be an honorable mistake. It might be a rectifiable mistake. It might be a mistake that lives forever, but a mistake is what it is for, and this is the core tenet of intentionalism. A text means what its author or author's intent. That's the bottom line. A text means what its author or author's intent. The consequences of this truth may not be pretty. Suppose for centuries a body of law was based on a phrase in a landmark opinion. And suppose further that some bright young law professor, there are hundreds of them, discovers that what the esteemed justice meant by the phrase in 1810 was not what it had always been taken to mean since. Now we're in a pickle and we have to choose between going with what the phrase actually means and thereby calling a great deal of settled law into question, or we stick with the venerable but mistaken and false meaning for the sake of maintaining the enterprise's stability. For me, the choice is an easy one. 
That is, do you go back to what you now understand to be the true historically intended meaning and thus have to you know, just throw out all the law that is preceded from the false meaning? Uh, or you, do you just continue with the false meaning? Uh, I would apply the rule proclaimed in uh, John Ford's movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Quote, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Uh, in thus choosing, I would be acknowledging well, that while the determination of meaning is an important part of whatever goes on in law, it is not the whole of law. And when the very fabric of the law, along with its intricate machinery, is put in danger by an irritable reaching after meaning, meaning must give way. While intentionalism is, as I've already said, true, there are times when its truth is properly sacrificed to a greater institutional good. One last point and I'm done. I said at the outset that textualism fails because it has no object. There is no text in and of itself, no text identifiable just as a text, as mere marks or sound, independently of the stipulation of intention. Just try it. You can't do it. Therefore, there is nothing one can point to of which it can then be claimed that it, as a standalone entity, bears meaning. If meaning has been imputed on whatever level, an intention has already and necessarily been assumed. There is no act of construing or understanding that is not rooted in intention. Think of the joking locution, hello, he lied. I'll repeat that. Hello, he lied. The joke works because we assume as a matter of convention that one utters hello with the intention of acknowledging fellowship of a minimal kind with another person. Hello, he lied, accuses the speaker of not having that intention and of therefore not meaning by hello what the rest of us mean by it as a matter of course. If hello seems to bear its meaning on its face, it is only because we usually hear it with an intention that is so ordinary that we cannot imagine its absence and we don't even know that we're listening within an intention. Hello, he lied, announces the absence of that intention and so puts the meaning of hello up for grabs. Even when we think we are speaking literally, we are not speaking literally. We are speaking always within some intention or another, within some code or another. Not only does textualism not work as a method because it has no object, but no one has ever been or could ever be a textualist. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fish. So we have a lot of questions in chat. Would okay. you like to go through them yourself or would you like me to? No, I'd, no, I'd rather you uh, sent them to me or read them to All me. Right. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, try to yeah. reply to you. Okay. Um, we'll start off with one of the first questions. With such multiplicity of meaning in every utterance, can we ever take communication as it takes place, or will there always be a tentative nature that is going to be ascribed to it? Uh, I'll give a double answer to that very excellent question. In general, in the given flow of conversation or in the given flow of uh, verbal exchange, whether in newspapers or books, uh, we can take the meanings that seem to us to be there as in fact being there. But there's always the possibility of someone stepping in and saying, oh, that's not what I meant, or oh, that's not what she meant. She meant. And when that happens, what is being said is, is that you don't understand the intention within which those words were spoken. So it's always possible to disrupt ordinary understanding, but ordinary understanding in general does occur. All right, thank you. And how would one read poetry, a medium that is filled with metaphors in the intentional capacity? Well, again, since you can only read in the intentional capacity, uh, you uh, read poems too, in the same way. Uh, I'm thinking of a poem by the 17th century poet, John Milton, a uh, famous uh, elegy, that is uh, a, a, a praise of the dead. 
uh, called Lycidas, L-Y-C-I-D-A-S. The first three words of Lycidas are yet once more. So the question is, what does yet once more mean? Now, of course, you can, they're very ordinary words. You can look at the dictionary meaning of yet once and more as a textualist would tell you to do. That's not going to get you anywhere. What you have to know is that this is a pastoral elegy. That's what the poet is writing. And that in the context of the pastoral elegy, uh, the first person voice is always lamenting the death of a singer or poet whose life was short, was cut off uh, by the fates. That is, he, he uh, and it's always a he in this tradition, he died young. So yet once more means, once again, I have to do this because once again, uh, the life of a promising poet has been cut short uh, by forces that pay no attention to his promise. And once again, I have to do this and no doubt someone will have to do this in relation to me uh, in subsequent, uh, when I grow up uh, and also am uh, cut off uh, before my prime. All of that is meant by yet once more, but you're never gonna get to it if you think that the task of interpretation is looking at words. Okay, uh, would you say that it is a gap in communication, this gap or a break in communication that allows us to exist as subjects? Would not I mean, our subjectivity, would our subjectivity not perish if communication becomes absolutely harmonious? I don't understand the question. So perhaps it could be repeated. Um, would you say that it is a gap in communication that allows us to exist as subjects? Okay, would not, stop. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Right. You want me to read the second part? No, no, that's okay. Look, communication as an act is a sign of distance. We communicate because we are not somewhere where ideally we would like to be. That is what language does. That is what sentences do. They're trying to use the word of the questioner, bridge a gap between uh, one person and another or between one person um, um, and the world. We are creatures defined, and I think this is what the uh, question, we are creatures defined by living in that gap, always attempting to understand, always attempting to put all the pieces together, never quite succeeding, but then always having to try again. Therefore, I think it could be said that we live in the gap and that that gap is subjectivity the condition of not being at the perfectly objective place that we would ideally like to be? How would a teacher teach in, a teacher text in the class? And how do young learners equip themselves to discern codes? How does one deal with this endless ambivalence in the classroom? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's endless ambivalence. Uh, or ambiguity. I think, for example, I often teach classes in religious poetry. It's one of, or I did when I was a professor of literature some years ago. Uh, and uh, within a few sessions, a couple of weeks of the class, the vocabulary of religious poetry, which concern, which includes its concerns, the questions that are most often asked, the anxieties that impel the poetry, et cetera. That vocabulary and everything that comes along with it is part of the uh, understanding mechanism or perceptual mechanism of the student. So the student doesn't come upon the words of a religious poem uh, as if they were just words uh, sitting there uh, waiting for him somehow uh, to decipher uh, what they mean. Rather, the, the, uh, the student hears the words within the assumption that what he or she is reading or listening to is a religious poem. Uh, this is the same point that I made with the example, uh, you have no consideration. Uh, you either, you utter that either as a lawyer speaking to a client or as a wife speaking to a husband, in those two contexts, you have no consideration will mean very differently. But, there is no baseline meaning of you have no consideration. So you're never in the position where you have just the words and then you have to figure out what intention produced them. If in fact, 
It's language you're dealing with and you're attempting to construe it. The intention has already come into play. You already know that it's a religious poem and therefore you are more than halfway home to the interpretive task. Okay. If all communication is a game of chance and language is always in flux, how does meaning emerge? How do you read equal in Brown versus Board of Education? Uh, it's not a game of chance. And I hope that I, I didn't say anything to suggest that it was. It's not a game of chance. It's a game of figuring out what language or code those who are speaking or writing to you are, are deploying. You could get it wrong, but you could get it right. Let's take literary criticism as a practice. Why does it exist? What are its goals? Its goal, of course, is to figure out what is meant by a poet. What do these words in a poem, what do these words um, in a poem mean? You know how to play this game. You know what the possible alternatives are. It's not that the field was wide open, that there were innever, innumerable plural meanings. There may be a multitude of interpretive choices within the genre of the poem or novel uh, that you're considering, but that's already been narrowed. Within that narrowing, you could still have disputes and disagreements. And that's what literary criticism is, dispute and disagreement about what a poem means or what a novel means. Uh, but those disputes are not open-ended. As I've said several times, they are already constrained and directed by your understanding of the intentional context you have uttered. Game of chance, no. Possibility of getting it wrong, yes. Those are not the same things. Okay. Can the interpretation of meaning be applied to decoding political conflict among countries that are at war, for example, and thereby possibly ending wars or literal, the possibility of nearly perfect dialogue? Uh, there's a long tradition, a long history, and I've written a book about this two years ago called The First. It's about the First Amendment. Uh, and, but it's also about the age old dream of finding a language, a common language purged uh, of perspective, bias, and prejudice, which could then be shared uh, by all parties to a dispute uh, so that all parties would in effect be on the same page, as we say, and move toward some resolution. There is no such language. No program of linguistic reform will ever lead uh, to harmony and understanding. There are lots of people in the world who still believe the opposite. So for example, the CEO of uh, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, a very rich and generally a very stupid man, uh, has said that the conflicts in the Middle East are not rooted in deep-seated hatreds, but in a failure of communication. How that guy ever made five bucks is beyond me because that's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard said. So get forget about salvation by linguistic reform uh, and instead roll up your sleeve and do the hard work of politics, which means making coalitions when you can, figuring out opportunities for action, advancing in the appropriate moment, recruiting in another appropriate moment. It's just a messy business. Uh, no magic keys available. All right. Um, Professor Fish, I think you have some travel arrangements made for right after this talk. Can you take one or two, one, two more questions? Oh, or yeah, sure. I have, I have plenty. We have at least 10, 12 minutes left. Okay. If the subject-object distinction is obliterated within an interpretive community, as you mentioned in an interview with Philosophy Now, how can a consensus be reached in the Habermasian sense? And who, 
mediates the political legitimacy of the discourse. Any question which contains the phrase Habermasian sense is in trouble. Habermas never gets anything right. Uh, there's no such thing as the ideal speech uh, situation. There's no such thing as forming, uh, engaging in a communicative um, uh, activity in which only the best arguments are used and all strategic or instrumental arguments have been set aside. Habermas is up Habermas has nothing to say to these issues. He is just offering an idealism which has no uh, relationship to the way in which language and the world works. Having delivered myself of this anti Habermasian rant, let me hear the question again. Um, if the subject object distinction is obliterated within an interpretive community, as you mentioned in if an the interview, one, I didn't. I didn't I didn't hear the beginning of it. The, the, the distinction between the subject and the object. The yeah. subject to object distinction. If, if that is obliterated within an interpretive community, as you mentioned in an interview. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what that means. Can you tell me what does it mean that the it's instance. And what is, can you hear me? I'm not sure what it, yeah, I can hear you, but I'm not, I'm not I'm not understanding what the question means. Okay. All right. So maybe the question lacks a little bit of an ambiguous question. Uh, maybe you could rephrase. Could you rephrase the question, perhaps? Um, let me try. That... Yeah. Let me try. I'm not sure. I complete. I got to get it myself. Um. I guess the idea. Uh, the idea is that there is a distinction. There's an implied distinction between the subject and the object. Yeah. And your position stands against that. Does it? Where? Um, according to an interview that you gave to Philosophy Now. I mean, that's what the, the person who posted the question is claiming. Well, I would have to have the interview in front of me. Perhaps we should pass on. I'm sorry. I'll, Perhaps I'll, we should pass no, on. No, no, no issues. Yeah, we'll move on to the next question. How do you think bilingualism and multilingualism affect the multiplicities of meanings and will it always be subjective and limited to an individual's understanding of a particular language? I am myself only bilingual in an extremely limited sense. I'm not very good um, um, uh, at languages. Um, I can imagine someone who is genuinely bilingual uh, hearing words in two different registers, uh, the registers of uh, uh, different uh, cultural or national uh, codes, um, and therefore having a richer sense of ambiguity uh, uh, than, uh, than I do. Uh, but I don't think if this is an implication of the question and I'm not sure whether it is, I don't think that being bilingual or multilingual uh, uh, puts one in any radically different position uh, than uh, someone like uh, me, who is uh, pretty much uh, restricted uh, to the English language has. That's about all I could do with that question, I think. Okay. And would you care to respond to Jacques Derrida's claim that there is nothing outside the text? Oh, Derrida, yeah. All, all, no, Derrida, what Derrida means by that, that's... <laughs> It's it, uh, nothing. Uh, what that means is that we do not ever know anything, whether it's persons or objects or parts of the world directly, but that everything comes to us within a description. Or as it's often said, everything is mediated. A direct knowledge of events or persons is unavailable uh, to human beings. So there's no objective uh, oasis uh, to which uh, we can turn or to which uh, we go uh, to settle disputes about texts. So in that sense, there is no outside to the text. We are always and uh, already textual creatures in that our way of knowing is discursive. Uh, um, uh, and uh, Richard Rorty said this, I think, uh, in one of his books, in a way that I find helpful. If I can, um, he 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 says he 
he said that the world is out there. There's certainly a world out there, but the world is out there, but the meanings the world has are not. This is not a direct quotation of Rory's, but what he meant by that is that whatever meanings are ascribed to the world are ascribed to the world within the linguistic resources we have. So although it exists independently of, of all of those linguistic resources, any access we have to the world, whether it's the world of objects or the world of persons, uh, is going to be linguistic or textual. All right. Uh, Professor Fish, would you like to take one final question or sh shall we? Yeah, I, shall have, we... I, I, have time. I have time for more than one. Okay. So this question is based off your example of the husband stating that we haven't uh, been to the movies in a long time. So based off yes, this example, right. could intentionalism be owed to intonations or other verbal cues for clearer understanding? And if not, what limits, what limits this? Say that again, it's a little slower. Um, I guess the question, the, the, the person who asked the question wants to know whether other cues, non-linguistic non, non or non-verbal cues may help us uh, you know, communicate or express oh, meaning yeah. better. Right, oh, absolutely, uh, of course. When we're in a situation and we're listening to someone, especially someone uh, we know, uh, there are going to be uh, clues uh, which will direct us uh, to uh, an understanding uh, of, of or harmony with uh, that intention. So yes, the answer is yes, there, there, there are plenty of clues in any situation. Are there a sufficient, uh, is there a number of clues which if reached assures communicative success? No, uh, it can always go wrong. It can always, it, it can always go wrong, uh, but for the most part, a combination of the dialects we understand, those we engage with to be speaking in, and our knowledge of their patterns and behaviors will carry us a long way toward understanding. It can never carry us the whole way so that understanding is absolutely objective and could not be questioned or disrupted. You say that there's a significant difference between iconic signs and arbitrary signs. Um, say more. Define iconic and arbitrary for me, please. Uh, but th that's all we have. He, this is not. Uh, he hasn't elaborated more about this. But I guess the idea that he's trying to refer to perhaps is the possibility of a universal kind of a sign language, perhaps, and how. Oh. Yeah, and then. No, there's no universal sign language possible except in a sociological sense, which is not an uninteresting sense. That is, there can be a pattern of usage uh, within a, a population, a population as large as a country, perhaps, uh, that is so well established that for all intents and purposes, it is universal. But all that means is that a local system of mark meaning correlations has gained a political and statistical ascendancy for the moment. That's all it means. So that I don't think the word universal can be cashed in um, in its strongest sense. All right. And one more. Is, one uh, more. Uh, last question. Yes. Can this uncertainty in figuring out the right code turn translations of literary works or can it alienate translations of literary works more from its intentional standard? Well, that's a terrific question. Uh, the task of translation depends on somebody being able uh, to live linguistically uh, in the two cultures that have produced one language and then the language into which that first is to be translated. So to be a very good translator is, and I am not, um, is I assume to be able to, uh, uh, to so inhabit either culture that the possibility that, that uh, you uh, can figure out what set of words will best capture 
uh, in culture B what was meant by the words uh, in culture A. It might not work out, however. There's a movie that Steven Spielberg did called Amistad a number of years ago. It's about a bunch of Africans who were uh, uh, shanghaied and sold into slavery and then found themselves uh, you know, on trial um, in uh, New England uh, for having assaulted and overpowered uh, their captives. Uh, the problem of the movie for a long time is communication because the Africans, the captured Africans speak a language that no one else uh, in uh, the New England town speaks till finally uh, a speaker of the original language is found. And he then acts as the middleman, uh, interpreting each to the other. But at a certain point, the American, uh, American lawyer for the Africans uses the word should. I should have said that, he says. The interpreter informs him there's no word for should in the Mende language. There's no word for should in the Mende language. In the Mende language, it's either, it's either yes or no, no word for should. And that's, I think, a brilliant moment uh, on the part uh, of Spielberg, if it is Spielberg uh, or, uh, or the uh, screenwriter uh, uh, of, of that movie, uh, in which the, both the possibility and the radical limits of translation uh, are, are made evident in a cinematic moment. Uh, let me thank you all, since that is, I, I think, the last question I'll be able to answer. Let me thank you all for uh, attending uh, and for an excellent uh, roster uh, of questions. And I wish all of you uh, the best success in the world. Give us one minute for thanking you also, Vimal. Just yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So we know that Professor Fish has some travel arrangements made for right after this talk. So thank you so much, Professor Fish, for taking some time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today. It was a pleasure and a privilege and an honor to listen to you speak. And on behalf of everyone here, let me offer our collective appreciation and thanks. And uh, my gratitude also to the manager of our college, Reverend Father Thomas Padiat, our principal. Father Reggie Gurian and Professor P.J. Thomas, the head of the department, for facilitating this commemorative lecture. It is the vision and the goodwill of uh, leaders like yourself that propel SB to scale greater heights. Thank you so much. And finally, thank you. Thank you all for joining us here today. This lecture has been made possible and meaningful only through your participation. Thank you for those excellent questions. And we hope you will join us again for all our academic endeavors. Thank you. Good night and stay safe. Thank you, Professor Fish. Hope you have a good flight. Yes. Well, thanks a lot. I'm going to yes. sign off now, okay? Thank you. No, no. Thank All right. You. Thank Be you. Safe. Thank you. Professor Fish, thank you. Be safe. All right. All, All right. the best to you. All the best.